So when we were trying to come up with topics for what we're going to do next, I thought, well, what, are the, what are the 15 things that I see people do wrong all the time? And, um, and it's kind of funny because uh, I came in with my wife and my daughter. We flew in Sunday night. And so we spent all day uh, Monday when we had great weather, by the way. And we went to Ellis Island and we're, went around uh, Statue of Liberty. And, and it, we saw a lot of those things that people do wrong. And so I was taking pictures. You'll see a couple of those people who don't even know they're in this presentation <laughs> doing stuff wrong. But, um, you know, it's the, it's the thing where as a photographer, you look at it and think, oh, if they just knew they could correct this one little thing, they can get some, a much better shot. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what are those mistakes, how to fix them, uh, or how to avoid them. And, and the hard, hardest part of this presentation is trying to go in and, and shoot images the wrong way. Right? As a photographer, we train ourselves, make sure that if you're going to be a slow shutter speed, that you pan with the subject. And I had to not do that. It was really frustrating. So um, my daughter was a good sport. Um, you'll get to see some of pictures of her where I said to her, OK, here's the things you have to do so I can shoot this wrong. And we did that over the last week. And we did some here on our trip. So um, we integrated some of the photos uh, from New York into the presentation as we went along here. So with that said, um, everybody always asks, and I thought I'd put this up front. This is how you get a hold of me. So my website is jeffcable.com. Uh, on Facebook, it's Jeff Cable Photography. And then on the blog, how many people here read the blog? Cool. So the blog, I blog every week, just blog this morning, some of the pictures from Ellis Island. People saw them, cool. Um, and I try to put up there how I shot it, why I shot it, you know, what intrigued me about that particular photo, what I did differently. And you'll see in the presentation today some of those images which we'll kind of use as hopefully things to do right when shooting. Um, so I'm going to start with my number one pet peeve, and I see this all the time. And this is combining light and shadow. And I see this a lot when people are doing uh, family vacations, uh, family portraits, and I, you know, I'll be in places where it's a great area, but they put them in the exact wrong place. So this is the shot I used uh, uh, for how not to shoot. This is uh, Claire, who's a friend of ours in the Bay Area. And um, this is really bad lighting. I've got it right in the middle of some sun, some shade, um, just really, really bad uh, place to shoot. Um, and the thing is, cameras don't like extreme differences between bright and shadow. It doesn't know how to expose. So it's either going to go for the dark side, which means your highlights will be blown out, or it's going to expose for the bright area, and everything's going to be too dark. What you really want is something more neutral, like this shot. Um, and this is, again, all in shade. I added light by adding my flash, and we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. But I added the light. But I was starting with the right location. I didn't have any shadows going through her. Now, the other shot that we saw before where the light was going in her face, there was something else wrong with that. And that was it was taken to the wrong location. And I see this a lot, too, where people just won't, they're afraid to move people around. So the family is there, and they say, oh, wait, you're all together. Let me take the picture. And behind them, let's look at that picture again of Claire, is a parking lot. Beautiful, right? <laughs> Ooh, it's a Camry. Um, so maybe it was a Honda, I can't tell. But whatever it is, it's not a good background. So when I shot this picture of Claire, and again, I was trying to shoot on how not to shoot, all I did is I took her, I moved her about a foot and a half away, and I shot it differently. I got her in a better light. And the same green that you see behind these cars, I just moved her so that she was closer to the cars, and that's all you see in the background. So. It's not the perfect picture, but it shows how much better it can be by just shifting someone over. And when I photograph a portrait of someone, even if it's someone I don't know, if someone has a really great looking weathered face and I want to take their photo and I ask them, and I did this when I was in Beijing at the Olympics, there was this woman dressed beautifully and, and everybody was shooting her photo, but she was in terrible light. I just said to her, and of course she spoke no English, I said, can we go this way? And I moved her into the shade and I took the picture. So you have to be willing to go ahead and take that little extra step, but it's worth it. The funny thing is, this is taken to that parking lot. About 15 feet from that parking lot is this area. And this is a little walkway by a hotel. And this is the back of the hotel. And that's where I shot this. But literally 15 feet away from that parking lot is where this is. And so it's a matter of just like looking for the locations. And when I go scout a location, I look for those areas that have good light, where I don't see lots of sunlight and shade mixed. I typically also like to work with a dark background if I can, because the human eye is always going to go to the brightest part of the frame, right? So in this case, I'm trying to light them so that the eye goes to them and not the background. 
All right. Oh, boy. Here we go. So um, I always tell people to email me and, 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 and you know, send me some photos. I'll be more than happy to critique them. Uh, and a lot of times I get this, where someone's got a really interesting subject, but it's not in focus. You want to make sure that your subject is in focus, because that whatever is sharp and bright is where the eye is going. So I get a lot of these. And people say, what do you think? And I see these on Facebook. The problem with social media is people don't know a lot, and they'll say, like, oh my god, that should be a postcard. <laughs> and I show you, and I'm like, no, it shouldn't. <laughs> but everybody thinks it's so beautiful. And I'm looking at myself, well, where's the focus? Well, the focus is on the leaves in the background, right here. That bud, that's a good shot, right? But the flower is out of focus. It should be more like that, right? That's a decent photo. This is not. I get a lot of photos like that, and, and it may not just be the subject, it may be something like someone's eyes. So if it's a portrait, make sure the eyes are sharp. I get a lot of photos like this. Allie was my subject here. This is in our backyard. And people say, oh, look at my daughter. And I go, oh, she's so cute. Well, she's wildly out of focus here. And then they say, OK, I know. I know that was out of focus. How about that one? <coughs> now, if you look at that from a distance, you might say, that one's not bad. But it's still not tack sharp on the eyes. So I'm going to move one forward here. Let's look at that one. That <coughs> one's sharp. So I, do, I don't see a lot like this. I do see a lot like this, where people say, Yo, isn't this a great shot? There are times when there's an amazing thing happening. Let's say it's a grandchild who's playing in the yard and it's a really great moment. Fine, this would probably do. But if you really want to get it right, you want it to be tack sharp on the eyes. So when I focus, I generally use my camera with a center point focus. I lock it in on the closest eye to me. And then I can hold the button down and reframe. Or sometimes, like right now, when I'm shooting around New York, I'm using what's called back button focusing, where I, I turn off the focusing from the button of the camera, and I use the back button to focus, so I can lock in on their eyes, and I can reframe the photo however I want and shoot it. But again, the key is to get on the eyes, unless you're going for something artistic and you don't want it on the eyes, but at least you, then you should know what your subject matter is and where you're trying to take the sub you know, your, your viewer. Okay. People always ask me on a group shot, where should I focus? And this is a tricky one. If you're shooting in an aperture of, let's say, 2.8 or f4, that's going to be tough to get a group shot. If you have two people in the frame and they're not exactly at the same plane from you, one's going to be in focus and one isn't. So maybe you want to shoot it at 5.6. Well, what happens now when you've got grandma and grandpa on a third row behind them? I generally focus at the middle row. And depending on how close I'm standing to them, I might shoot at f8. Now, with longer zoom lenses, it's going to you know, amplify that. So with a longer zoom lens, you may want to be at f11. But typically, I'll try to focus on the eyes of someone right in that middle row and give myself a little bit of leeway with the aperture. Okay. But you want to draw the viewer in with whatever's in focus. So that's the key. And you want to draw them to where you want them by just locking it in, making it sharp, and then if, it's, if everything else falls out of focus, that's OK. Wrong aperture. Um, this is one that's tricky. Uh, how many people here are shooting in aperture priority mode? OK. How many people here are shooting manual? Cool. How many people here are photographers? OK. And how many people are just heavy, casual hobbyists? OK. So. When you're working with aperture, I actually prefer to shoot an aperture priority for two reasons. Well, for the main reason is this. As we talked about focus and drawing the attention, I want to be able to take that photo, and I want to determine where someone's looking. That's why I shoot an aperture priority mainly, because as I'm shooting, I'm thinking, OK, do I want depth of field or do I not? So in the case of um, this photo um, of this fireman, the truck was behind him. That's what the lights are that you see. But I chose, I want those to be diffused because I want to draw the viewer to him and not the fire engines. Now, I, might, I could also shoot this at f16, if I have enough light and a tripod maybe, at f16 and get everything in focus, if that's what I'm trying to portray. That's not what I wanted to do here. I wanted to kind of give a hint of the fire engines, but I want them to look at him. Now, this shot is totally different 
uh, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge, I wanted everything in focus. I want the background in focus. I want the cables in focus. I want everything to lead you through the photo. So I shot this at F-16 to be able to do that. But that's conscious. So the challenge with it being a photographer is people think we walk around and just hit a button, right? They think there's like nothing here. Anybody can do that. And they go, well, how much, what are your rates? Oh, no, I'll just get my uncle to do it. He's got DSLR. <laughs> He'll shoot our wedding. We're good. Okay. Um, but you, uh, as Ansel Adams said, the most important feature of the camera is what's 12 inches behind it, right? The noggin. And so I'm thinking every time I'm shooting, I'm thinking about what I want in focus, how much I want in focus. So let me go back for a second here. Um, so if you don't know how to control that, learn that. And for those of you who have new cameras where they have the whole spectrum of focus buttons lit up, turn that off. <laughs> Drives me crazy. It's actually my number one. I should create another presentation. The thing the camera companies do wrong, why they light all of those, ca those focus buttons up out of the box with the camera drives me crazy. Read the manual, figure out how to get it to a single point, and you'll get much better shots. Because what happens with the DSLR is you go to hold the button halfway down, and the camera's going to say, oh, I think you want to focus here or here. Well, how's it know, right? So get it to one point where you can then control that. Um, so the other thing I talk about here is getting away from the point and shoot look. With a typical point and shoot camera, they tend like almost like the old Kodak Instamatics. The idea was to get everything in focus. Well, the problem with that is then you can't direct them. So I always tell people, learn aperture priority, learn to shoot at a low aperture number or a high aperture. So if you can shoot at f4 or f2.8, or if you really want to get crazy and spend a lot of money here at B&H, an f1.2 lens, <laughs> you can have some fun. How many people here have ever shot a camera at f1.2 or 1.4? Tricky, right? You, if you're off by that much, forget it. You'll lock in on this eye by the time you get back to this hair here or ear, it's gone. So when you go to take that photo, if you're close up, you gotta be really careful. What's really cool about those lenses is if you're shooting, let's say, the father-daughter dance, where there's tons of people watching them dance and they're in the middle, you can isolate them and everybody else becomes out of focus and you can really draw the attention where you want it. So I love trying that from a distance. Um, it's cool to do. So let's uh, move forward here. Bad composition, and I will tell you that um, my wife, who's here has a, a really good eye and she can shoot photos with a iPhone or a point and shoot and get really good shots. It's something I had to learn. I tend to be very technical when I'm shooting, uh, a little less on the artistic side. So I had to actually learn good composition. And a lot of that is frankly, looking at photo magazines, looking at the internet, being inspired what, uh, by, by what other people are doing. Um, and just you know, kind of getting outside your comfort zone. And I do this a lot where I will purposely go shoot something with a different perspective or a different lens just to break myself out. And I just did this at a workshop with Greg Gorman uh, and Stephen Wilkes last week. We were shooting a subject matter that I'm not used to shooting and it was really hard. And so it was trying to figure out, you know, okay, how am I gonna tackle this one? Cause it's not what I usually shoot. Um, so the first thing with composition is what is your, know what your subject is. This is a tough one people, for people that shoot landscapes because they shoot a landscape and they say, do you like this picture? I go, I do like that picture. What's the subject to that picture? And they can't answer that. So you wanna know what the subject is. If it's a mountain range, fine, that's your subject. If it's a stream coming down, is it the stream or is it the fall colors of the leaves on the rocks? You know, know what that subject is because if you know that, it'll help you to create a better photo. Now, uh, angling photos can be really good, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but be mindful of your angle and why you're, you're shooting at, at an angle. We're gonna talk about horizons in a little bit because that's another one that drives me crazy. My brother's great at this. He'll send me vacation pictures with the oceans like this. Um, help, the boat is sinking. Um, one of the other things I see people do when they do composition, especially when they're shooting animals or kids, is they shoot from, well, I'm 5'11", so I say don't shoot at 5'11". Because if you're looking down at these kids, you're not seeing it from their world. We're seeing it from ours. So you want to get low 
and do that. So an example here is uh, our old dog Bailey. Um, he loved digging his snout in the snow when we took him to the snow. But I didn't want to take it from up here. I want to get down his level, so I got down and shot it. And it brings you into their environment, right? So a lot of the photos that I see people take are from that high position looking down. Now, as a sports photographer, when I'm shooting things like the Olympics, wherever, we get low and shoot up. Because if you shoot from a low position up on athletes, it makes them powerful. It makes them much bigger and stronger. So there's another advantage to that. And again, you want to think about as you're shooting what your shooting position is. And even like when we were at Ellis Island shooting, there's times I wanted to be up on the balcony shooting, but there's also times I want to get low to the floor or a pathway to get a completely different look. And you'll be amazed when you look through your camera what the difference is between standing and shooting and getting low or even laying on the ground and get a totally different shot. So sometimes I'll even go high, maybe midway down, and then down to the ground and shoot. Uh, let's talk about this one. No need to shoot head to toe. This is probably the most um, abused rule in the family vacation photos. Everybody's shaking their head. Um, and, and a lot of times when I'm shooting an event, like I just did on Saturday, you know, they say they want to get everybody head to toe and that's the way they want the shot. And I'll shoot it for them. And then I'll say, but can I do it my way now? And then what I'll do is I'll just come up about torso up, get them in close and do the shot. And inevitably that's the one that they order. Now it's not to say that you should never shoot head to toe. Maybe you do one that way and then come in tighter. But really, you, there's an advantage to coming in close, and we're going to talk about that coming up. How about this one? Not always centered. And this is one I still do. I still center a lot of my photos. But it depends what you're trying to portray. Just like we talked about with Aperture, where do you want people to look? So let's take a look at this photo that I took off of Highway 280. Uh, it's just a regular highway right in California. I go by it all the time. This tree that's off to the side. Would that photo be as good if it was centered? Probably not. I didn't even try it. I wanted the eye to start at the tree and kind of work its way down the hillsides. And I purposely framed it to get all three of those hillsides in the frame as a kind of a pattern to take you in through that image. Same thing with my daughter when she was small in Chicago. I could have centered that, but I didn't. I wanted her off to the side because I wanted the sea of red chairs to kind of be the background, but I wanted her to be the focus. And then this one, which I shot in my backyard of the moon. And this is interesting, because whenever there's a super moon like we had on Sunday night, how many people here shot that? Okay, I didn't, I was flying here, so I missed it. <laughs> Although I will say that when we drove in from Newark, we could see it behind the city and it was killing me. Like I, wanted, like, I was so tempted to tell that cab driver to stop, um, but we didn't. But what you'll see is a lot of people post an image of the moon and just the moon. And really, if you look at like what USA Today posted on their favorite images of the supermoon, it's almost never just the moon, right? There's something either in the foreground or something in the background. There's just some other element to add to it. So in this case, this is just a shot I did in my backyard. I purposely put it off the frame. Uh, you can kind of see it on this display. You could definitely see it on these where you'll see the trees um, also in front of the blue sky to kind of help frame the moon. So again, it was a conscious decision, just like this shot from Russia before the Olympics, I went to Moscow. I could have centered it, and I did actually do some shots with it in the center, but I like the fact that it was off-centered with the bridge and the colors of the lights on the bridge kind of taking you out of the frame. So don't be afraid as a photographer to try to shoot off-center. And it's not to say, again, that you shouldn't, but try some other things, different things while you're at it. Shooting tight, and this is another one where, um, you know, it's personal choice, but the closer you are to a subject, the more you become part of that subject. So I like getting in tight, and I see this a lot with sports photographers where they'll send me something and say, you know, what do you think of this? And you can tell they shot it from, you know, row 82 of the arena. And sometimes that's the best access you have. I get that. And sometimes it could be amazing if there's a cool shadow from the athlete or whatever. But for the most part, they're not as good as if you come in really close. And I think that's true for portraits too. Um, so let's take a look at 
Allie. We shot this a couple days ago uh, back home. This is Allie on, on the uh, playing field hockey or on the field. Not bad, decent shot. It tells you, you know, the sport she's playing, this is just a different look, right? Now we're more into Allie. Here we're kind of looking at the goalposts in the background, the trees, the blown out sky, uh, whatever else is in the background. Here we're just looking at Allie. Here we're looking at a cowboy uh, that we shot at this workshop uh, last week. And I, I like it because I like having the fence again as, as adding to the image, putting them off centered. But it's not, there's nothing wrong with that frame at all, but this is a totally different look. So again, it's not that you shouldn't shoot that way, but shoot also tight. And I, and I do this like when I'm shooting flowers, I might shoot the whole plant and then I'll go in and just shoot maybe one bud or one flower. So just looking at the difference between this shot and this shot, you, you're seeing more in his eyes, you're, see, you're getting a little bit more of a feeling of who he is. Here's your typical tourist shot that I shot on uh, so, uh, Monday. Yep, you've never seen that before, have you? <laughs> I mean, everybody has that shot. So I took it because I could, and because you know I'm shooting on 128 gig cards, I can shoot whatever I want. Um, <laughs> and you know, and, and the thing is, why not? I mean, it's, it's still kind of cool. It gives an idea of what it's like. Uh, I've been there, but I mean, I've been on a boat around it before. Um, but this is the shot I liked better. Now there are some people who may argue, "Whoops, you missed the flame," which is true. But I like, that, I like the way this is shot. I like the way that we see all the different angles and the shadows. And I like the way that her arm kind of takes you out of the frame, right? So again, shoot tight because you can. Try things different. Keep moving around. Try different angles. This is a shot I did um, of uh, one of the models last week. Really tight. Cut off her head. Uh, and some people might say, you can't do that. You can't cut off her hair. Well, how about this one? You don't even see their faces. Good shot or bad shot? Personal preference. I like it, because to me it's more about people walking on the bridge than who these two people happen to be. And of course, I don't even know who they were. And it saves me having to get a signed release. Huh. <laughs> Different look. The wrong use of flash, oh boy. Um, this is a tough one, because this could be a whole presentation in itself. Um, flash can be really great during the day. I just, uh, the um, event I shot on Saturday back home, the party was outside at two o'clock, actually from about one to about four, which most photographers would charge double for, right? You know, like, you're in the sun all day, I'm not doing that. Um, I use a flash almost the entire time. Um, and the reason is it helped me get rid of some of those harsh shadows that were there in the background or caused on my subjects. So. I actually like using a flash during the day. You saw those pictures I, I showed you earlier with the kids in the ferns when they were walking or the girl that was standing by the pillar. Those, I added a little bit of flash. Now I don't keep the flash at full power. I keep the flash at like minus one stop. So I'm adding just a little bit of light. But I'm not overpowering them. Because what you don't want is people look at the photo and go, oh, you used a flash. Typically that's, I mean, you've added too much. And the flash can be harsh. I mean, if you pop a flash a lot, you know, full power, it can be a little, it, it just flattens out everything. Um, so here's a, a shot of Claire again. This is uh, when we were showing how not to shoot. A beautiful hair light coming behind her. Love that. Problem is if I shoot it without a flash, we get a silhouette. So I did the same thing by turning on the flash. You'll see the hair light still there, but I lit her face with the flash. So learn how to use that flash during the day as much as you would at night, and you'll get a good shot. This one I shot on Saturday at the party. Cute little girl, bad location. And the funny thing about this was her mom was setting all the kids up here. And I said, oh no, you don't want to shoot them here. And she goes, yes I do. And then the little kid goes, mom, he's a photographer. <laughs> it was really funny. And so what we did is I spent the next like five minutes walking them to all these different locations that were good and bad to teach her. It was pretty funny. Um, so this is a little girl in one location. I turned her around, literally turned her around. She didn't even move her feet. And I shot this picture of her. Same girl. Look at her raccoon eyes here, right? So not only are her eyes sunken and dark, but we have the reflection or the shadows coming. I mean, her face is half shadowed. Her, her 
face is being shadowed on her body. And just turning her around, you'll see the light is now coming from behind her and adding that flash. It's a totally different kid. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid. And when I do shots, I'll turn them around. And inevitably, I did this at the USA Water Polo. I turn all the winning team around at uh, the US Open. And one of the dads came over to me. He's like, no, you're doing this wrong. And I'm like, I got this. He's like, no, we always have the sun right into their faces. I said, then you get them doing the, the squinty look. Um, you know, people think you're doing it wrong. Turn them away from the sun, add some flash. It's great. So as I mentioned, I like to shoot an aperture priority because I like to know my aperture and control it. The challenge with that is you've got to be cognizant of what your shutter speed is. So my daughter, Allie, second shoots with me sometimes. I'm putting you on the spot. And I'll say to her, OK, so your aperture, what was your ISO when you're shooting in this dark room? And I'll say, what was your shutter speed? Just say, I, I don't remember. You need to know that. Because as a photographer, if you're shooting dancing, you better not be a 20th of a second, right? If you're shooting sports, you better be at a thousandth of a second if you're trying to freeze the action. So even though you're in aperture priority, you're in that, that aperture mode, you gotta be cognizant of what the shutter speed is in the lower, you know, in your camera, be looking at that. And shutter speed can be good and bad, depending on what you're going for. A slow shutter speed can be really cool when used correctly, and a fast one can be really cool because you can freeze stuff. So um, it can either make or ruin a photo. Here it ruined a photo. This is the hardest shot, shot for me to take because I'm trying not to pan with her, which I'm trained to do. Because I could have probably could have got some decent shots even at this slow aperture. But this is the kind of stuff where if you're shooting it at 40th of a second, it's not going to work for action. I can guarantee you that this type of shot, you're not going to get at 100th of a second. So I shot this in Sochi. This is at 1250th of a second to freeze the action with her in the air, puck on her stick. Typically for sports, I'll try to keep it around a thousandth of a second if I'm trying to freeze the action. Here in Central Park, totally different. Here I might slow it down to maybe 20th of a second or sometimes even less than that, maybe even a fifth of a second, depending on how fast it's moving. In the case of a horse and carriage, it's not going all that fast. So you may want to even slower shutter speed. If it's someone on a bike that's zooming by, you might be able to get good motion blur at a hundredth of a second and pan with them. But here, I'm actually using that blur to my advantage versus ruining an image. Some of you have seen this image from uh, the London Olympics. Um, and the funny thing about this one is I purposely shot it this way to get the motion of their feet and their hands. Some people look at this and go, oh, God, it's out of focus. That's a throwaway. So again, personal preference. I panned on this shot. I think I was at 100th of a second or maybe 80th of a second. I'm panning with the woman in the middle, which is why she's tack sharp. Here's two shots from Sochi Olympics. This one here is at 8,000th of a second because these guys come by crazy fast. These guys are seriously lunatics. <laughs> they come by so fast. So I'm, as I told you before, I'm used to shooting it at 1,000th of a second. I tried this at 2,000th of a second, and I looked down at the camera, and it was blurry. I'm like, oh my god, these guys are flying. Um, so I, I had to go all the way up to 8,000th of a second. You could tell it's nighttime, and they had lights. Thank goodness. Um, but you don't even see them coming. You just hear them coming. You hear this rumbling, and then you just get ready to like spray and pray. And you just they come by, you're like, Brrr, and you hope you got them. But they're really moving fast. I did the same shot, um, but I changed the shutter speed. And I let them actually show some motion. I kept the camera still and let the slider come through and blur, again, to give it a little bit different feel, a little bit more action. It's what I'm trying to portray. This is one of my favorite shots that I've taken in the last year and a half. Um, this was shot at 40th of a second, handheld of an Indy car. It was going really fast. and. Um, I was shooting this, obviously, it's the Lexar race car. That's why I was there. I was at Indianapolis to shoot this car. And I started at 200th of a second and panned. And I'm like, oh, I got it. So then I went to 120th of a second. I got that, too. I went to 80th and kept working my way down. And at 40th of a second, I could tell you, the way it works with motion panning is you've got to be slow enough shutter speed to blur everything, 
but you have to pan at the exact same speed as the car is going by. So you're literally bursting off frames and you're just like, you know, twisting your hips and trying to get it. And this one frame is like tack tack sharp. It was pretty tough to get, but um, fun. Cause then I'm blurring the background. You don't see the crowd. You don't see all the grass on the road. You're seeing the car. But the cool thing about indie cars is you're seeing the spin of the wheels as well. So that's using the shutter speed to my advantage. That's me shooting, looking and saying, okay, I'm at 40th of a second. I know what I'm at. I know I'm gonna try to get here. Um, and again, in sports, I'll tweak the aperture to get the shutter speed that I want to achieve. Same thing's true for night shooting. I still might stay in aperture priority, but I'm watching that shutter speed. So if I'm on a tripod, I want to get a night shot. I want a little bit more, a longer exposure to even out the water, let's say in a photo. I'll just roll the aperture to f16 or f22, watching the shutter speed to see where it's going to go. I want to get to eight seconds, I'll do that way. <coughs> okay, now we're going to put the guy in the spot. Bad camera basics. Um, and I, I see this a lot where people hold the camera incorrectly. And there's a couple of like very simple tips, which I'm going to show you here. There's a reason on these cameras why this part is curved the way it is. Check this out, ready? Ta-da! Your fingers actually fit underneath that. What a concept. I see a lot of people doing portraits this way. You have much better gripping this way. The other thing is, I always tell people, keep your hand underneath that lens, especially with long lenses. Hold it this way. I see a lot of people doing this, and you don't get the stability. Having that hand underneath. So hold it correctly, and, and plant your feet. And I do this in, in, instinctively now when I shoot. Even if I'm just shooting like around Ellis Island like we were on Monday, I'm still planting my feet and trying to get to where I want. I may even lean against the railing to get extra steady. Even if I'm at 500th of a second, I still try to plant the feet and get steady. And I see all kinds of people, you know, this is the summer of the selfie, is it not? Everywhere we've gone, we've seen people with poles and GoPros and iPhone holders. And, you know, I, I swear it's incredible to me how many people you see now doing the selfie thing? It's everywhere. Um, but they're, getting, they're not planting their feet. They're not doing anything right. They're just kind of like hoping to God they get their shot. But if you're going to take a good photo, you want to be steady. And I see people that have the right settings, but they can't get a clear shot because they're just not holding it steady. Um, and don't shake when you're shooting. I see a lot of people do that where they do like me, where they're type A crazy people and they drink 27 Diet Cokes before they come up here and present. And they're like, I got this, I got the shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my favorite one. Using the lens hood upside down or outside. This is great. This is a guy, I, I don't even know who he is. This is on our boat. How many times have you? <laughs> I'm apologizing up front. If he ever watches this YouTube video, I'm in trouble. How many times have we seen this? How many people here have gone up to someone on the streets and say, oh, we got to turn around, right? Because what happens is the sunlight, especially here, you're in the middle of the day on a boat. We're looking at the Statue of Liberty. That light's going to hit that lens and it's, it's not, you're not going to get as good an image. But inevitably, people think it's a perfect way to keep the front of your lens clean, I guess, because they never take them and turn them around. So why even have it there? Just get rid of it, right? Turn around, I always shoot, even when I'm indoors, even when I shoot hockey, I'll shoot with the hood on. Because you never know what kind of lights might be coming down hitting the frame. The only time I don't shoot with the lens hood is if I'm shooting ice hockey at an NHL game and we're shooting through the glass, through the hole. Because if it falls off, what's it look like? <laughs> so I have a friend of mine who's a photographer, his actually fell off and one of the players came along and took a slap shot at it. <laughs> That's a real story. So um, I don't use it for that. But don't do this. Um, well, well, we're going to get questions at the end. I promise. Hold that. I'll get to you. Um, but don't, you know, don't do this. I mean, protect it. Shield it as much as you can. And sometimes even if I've got really tough angle of light, I'll even take my hand as I'm shooting. And now I'm not holding the lens right. I know. But I'll even take my hand and I'll kind of cup it over that lens hood to add some additional shade. Um, I was doing a portrait shoot about a month ago 
And uh, Allie came with me and she brought the, the reflector and we left it in the black case. And she just kind of held that over my lens because I had such an extreme angle of light coming through. So having that, keeping that light off the lens, unless you're going for sunbursts, is a really good thing. So don't do this. Apologies, I hope he accepts apologies in advance. All right. Oh yes, we see this all the time, don't we? How many people have seen this one? You're, at, uh, you're, you're looking out over an entire city, right? You're in the New Jersey side. And someone goes, I'm gonna get a great shot of all of New York City and Manhattan. And they take their phone out with the flash on. Cause what's it gonna do, right? <laughs> There's gonna be a bunch of people on the New York side going, ah! Like, you're not gonna, it's not gonna light up the city, right? And the other one I love is, uh, I see this a lot of hockey games where people like, there'll be a fight at the hockey game and people in the stands will go start taking pictures with their flash on and behind the glass. <laughs> like you might get a shot if you turn the flash off, you know, it's not gonna be great, but you'll get it. But shooting a flash through glass is not gonna help you. So. At night, and I see this everywhere I go, people, you, you have a very slow shutter speed if you're shooting at night. Your best bet is to have a tripod. And I almost always travel with a tripod because inevitably there's a cool shot. And trust me, if I could have gotten out of that cab and shot the super moon Sunday, I would have. Um, but again, low light, slow shutter, have something steady. Um, turn off the flash unless you have someone in your picture. If I'm trying to take a photo of my family in front of some, uh, a night sky, whatever, I might use a flash to light them so I can see them with whatever's behind them. Um, and you know it doesn't have to be a tripod. Sometimes you can work off a wall. I find that very limiting because the wall's never in the right place. Although I did go up to the top of the Empire State Building on Monday night. We, we did everything Monday, by the way. We did New York in a day. <laughs> How many, we walked 11 miles. Did we not do 11 miles? We did 11 miles of walking. Uh, which I love, got my Fitbit in my pocket, I'm always watching that. Uh, but we went to the top of the Empire State Building and believe it or not, uh, they don't allow tripods, as we all know, but there's a, there are some ledges there where you can rest your camera really steady and actually get some pretty decent night shots up there. But that's not always the case. So um, in this case, this is taken in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and there's a, every, I can tell you that there, I was shooting this one, there must have been 500 people shooting, well, probably more than that shooting the fountains at uh, Bellagio at this time. 99% of them were using a phone with their uh, phone or camera with a flash on. You're not gonna get that great a shot. It's not gonna happen. This was taken on a tripod, slow shutter, so I get a little bit of the, the motion of the fountains. And it makes it much more interesting. Same thing with Sochi. This is the uh, right before closing ceremonies, the Olympic flame. Uh, as you can tell, it was just after sunset. Um, but again, you get some of the motion of the flames there. And uh, you couldn't do this without a tripod. And you can't do it handheld. So not everybody wants to carry a tripod around with them all the time. I get that. Or sometimes you can't. Um, but if you really want a good night shot, you're going to have to. It's that simple. And let me give you a little trick on how to do it. If you want to do the portrait of someone in front of, let's say I wanted to shoot a portrait of one of the athletes in front of this. What I would do is I would take the person out of the frame. I would, I would meter this and I'd say, okay, this is supposed to be at F125th uh, of, or actually, let's say F56 for three seconds. Then I'd add the person back into that frame at those settings. Okay, so I go three seconds at f5.6, and then I'd put the flash on the camera, and then I'd start playing with the flash. How much power do I need to light them without you know, completely you know, making them a beacon of light? But maybe lower the flash a little bit and try, or just use TTL as a starting point, and, add, and light them and add them to the frame. Hopefully that makes sense. This is uh, um, Hong Kong from uh, the top of what's called The Peak. And again, the reason I use this photo is because it just cracked me up how many people were there? I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of people that went up there that paid to go to the top to get the shot, and they had their phones. It's not gonna work. Um, this is a piano, piano of about, I think I did three or four different shots with the 5D Mark III, and then put them together. But again, you gotta be rock solid, because these are two or three second exposures, which is really tough to do if you're on a boat, because even the little bit of emotion of a boat's not gonna make it happen. Just to give you an idea about my night shooting, when I shoot on a tripod, I don't even touch the camera. I use either a cable release or the timer, 
and I'll hit that because even the motion of touching that camera is enough to actually send it off and ruin the photo. And if you want to go really anal, you can actually go into live view mode, which then locks the shutter of the camera, which makes it even steadier. And I'll do that sometimes. Here's one that people probably may not expect, and that is looking in the wrong direction. I see this a lot at places like Yosemite, where everybody's looking at Half Dome, and there's something unbelievable happening behind them. Uh, like, you know, the sunset, and they're looking at Half Dome, and behind on El Capitan, the golden light is hitting. Or there could just be a person that's really you know, interesting behind you at an event, and I'm shooting something like the dance, the father-daughter dance, but you know, grandma might be crying right here. I need that shot. Look in the different directions, because um, the best shot isn't always in front of you. It may not even be behind you. It may be left, right, could be above you or below you. So you want to think about as you're shooting, you know, what else is there? And when I go to a place, Statue of Liberty is probably the best example. Everybody shoots the Statue of Liberty from the same spot in the front. But what else is there, right? Are there ways to shoot that a different way? And I'll show you that too. But, you know, this was an office building in Toronto. I was going to a meeting, I had my camera, and this was just in the front garden of an office building. And so um, I, was, I looked around as I was, you know, and everybody else was sh shooting the skyline. I thought, saw this and thought, that's really pretty. Now, the other thing I should mention here is when we talked about aperture, this was a conscious decision to make that center of the frame perfectly in focus, but the foreground and background out of focus. Because I wanted people to be drawn to the center of that image. Here's one little different here in Times Square. Again, uh, how, many, how many millions of pictures are taken in Times Square every like day? <laughs> Right, I mean, there's no one that walks through Times Square like this. They walk through Times Square like this, right? Everybody's taking photos, but how do you do it differently? I can tell you that looking down Times Square toward where the ball drops is not a unique photo. <laughs> um, and it's not, again, it's not that you shouldn't take it, because I've taken it, especially my first trip here. But after a while, it's like, okay, I got that one. Right? How do we do something different? This was on one of those trips I told you about where I forced myself to take a fisheye lens and that's all I used that whole evening. And you went, instead of avoiding the hot dog carts, which actually has some pretty good food here, I just thought, what the heck, I'll shoot through one, trying to do it differently. So just looking around me and trying to see what could be unique. This one from the London Olympics, um, and this is one of those ones I was shooting for USA Water Polo uh, in London. And this is one of these moments where, um, and I showed this before here, but his wife handed him his baby. And I can tell you that most of the photographers, we had just finished the game. Most people were packing up and getting out because we're under deadline and we're trying to get images. And I looked over and saw him get the baby and ran over there to get that shot. And part of that, part of being a good photographer is keeping your eyes open all the time and being aware of your surroundings. So when people try to hire me to shoot an event and they say, can we give you a shot list? I usually say, no. And then they look at me like, well, you're not very accommodating. And I say, well, the reason I don't want a shot list is because A, I don't know who grandma you know, is yet. I'll have someone who knows who all these people are help me out, but I don't want to be looking at a list as a photographer, if you're looking down at a list all night, you're missing what's really happening. And I always tell them, look, a good photographer is gonna look at that list and they're gonna know what to get and then put it in their pocket and never have to see it again. And I tell the, the mom, if you wanna look at the list to make sure I got, you know, we can cross-reference it together, but I'm not gonna be looking down. If I was looking down at this moment, I would have missed a shot, right? So be aware of everything that's going on. This is a tough one. I see this, I, I'm not sure, it's almost like people are magnetic. Because every time you go to take a photo, what do they do? They go like, dunk. take it now. I don't know how that works, but people are attracted to walls and bushes. <laughs> and um, I will, seriously, every time I shoot outdoors, like whether it's a family portrait or an event, and I say, oh wait, let me get the five of you together. They might be 10 feet from a bush. They get sucked into it. Like, they just, <laughs> like, like, and then I have to say, no, 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 no. Come toward me, and they go, why? Trust me. And I move them away from that wall or that bush. Now, here's what happens. 
If you're shooting with a flash and the people are up against the wall, you can see it from the screen here, I'm getting a harsh reflect or a shadow on that wall. If someone's standing here, you can see mine. If you're here, you're gonna get that shadow. As I move away from that wall, my shadow gets less pronounced, okay? If you're trying to shoot, let's say, and it's a bush, you're not gonna get good separation between your subject and your background if they're up against it. So just like we talked about in bad lighting, I tell that family, let's everybody move away from that background. And they look at you like you're crazy because they're so used to doing the back up to the bush and wall thing. So I move them away. So separate them from that background. Here's a picture I did at an event a couple years ago um, with a couple, they loved that bush. They wanted to go back to the bush and it was pretty. <laughs> And it was really pretty because the colors in the trees are great. It was like, get away. Now, by creating them, bringing them toward me, now I end up with a diffused colors, but it's not like the brain of my viewers going, what do I look at, them or the bush, right? Common mistake, I shot this at F4 or F2.8 so I could create enough, enough, enough uh, separation between them and the background, okay? So get them away from the background. Now, everybody here knows that your depth of field is determined by how far you are from your subject and how far your subject is from the background. So if I want a lot of separation, I'll get close to my subject, maybe three or four feet from them, and they'll be 25 feet from the background. In this case, I couldn't because it was a pretty small area, but I actually want a little bit of that background to show through. So I was probably about five feet from them and they were probably five feet from the background. Uh, taking too little, few, too few frames. How many people here are, are still using film? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Zero. For you in the YouTube world, there is not one person here that raised their hand. It's not surprising. I mean, digital has gotten so good that, um, you know, it's just, it's awesome. Memory is cheap. Now, it's really cheap for me because I work for Lexar. Uh, <laughs> so I've got more memory cards than I know what to do with. It's great. I can shoot till I'm dead. But, <laughs> But memory cards have gotten very inexpensive and they're huge. I'm showing here, this is a 256 gigabyte, a quarter terabyte in a compact flash card. You could not, I don't even think I could shoot and fill this card in a day. The most I think I've ever shot was at the London Olympics when the woman, woman won gold medal. I think I shot like 74 gig in one day. Um, that's a lot of memory. You could take a whole trip to Africa and probably shoot on one card. Um, but it's gotten inexpensive and, and they're big enough that you can take more than one picture. And here's what kills me. Let's go back to our family portrait. People will get everybody together for 10 minutes, moving them all around, getting good position. And then they go, got it. <laughs> no way. Now, when I shoot portraits, I'm always blasting out at least three or four images of each grouping. If the grouping is more than four or five people, let's say we have 25 people in the group, I will shoot 10, 15, even 20 shots. Because here's what happens. We all know people blink, right? But then you have the little kid in the front. Where's that little kid looking? This way, that way, crying, eyes closed, or doing the funny face, whatever it might be. There's a hundred things that could happen. But to take and get everybody together and group and take one shot is crazy. In the old days of film, you could argue you only had 12 frames to take and that's all you have with you. But today, even with an eight gig card or 16 gig card, you have tons of shots to take. So take a lot. How many people here have their camera in single shot mode? Don't. Because there's really no reason to have it in a single shot mode. I always have mine in burst mode shooting. Now, let me, let me quantify that. The 5D Mark III when I'm in a slower burst mode, I'm taking it like three frames a second, okay? But it gives me the ability in those cases where something good is happening, where I can just hold it down and get three frames a second. If I only want one frame, I just tap on the shutter. So if I want one frame, lens cap, I'm a pro. So, <laughs> right? I do this all the time. Like, I got this and they go, uh, sir? I go, yeah, I got it. Um, so, right, I can tap it one frame or I can hold it down and shoot more. I always keep it in, a, in, a, in the burst mode because most of the time I don't take one picture. Even like the Statue of Liberty, I'm not just doing one, I'll do two or three just to make sure I have them. And then I'll take the best of those. So now, 
with that said, with my Canon 1DX, it does 12 frames a second. I don't want to do a portrait of someone and go, wait, oh, smile, Brrr, you know, freak them out, right? <laughs> I've done that, it's pretty funny. Actually, when you do that, you get really good smiles out of people, because they look at you like, what the heck was that? But typically at three frames a second, keep it in that mode. So unless you're using a really fast camera, keep it in something that lets you do multiple exposures, because there's amazing the difference between, forget the group shot, let's just take the portrait. That split second, when someone lets her guard down and the girl's not doing the little can smile, but she actually breaks in a real smile. Or something happens, she's like, what? And she, and whatever, it might just be something little. The eyes, yes, there's shots where the eyes are closed, but you'd be surprised how many shots where the eyes are almost open, but not quite. And if you shoot three or four, you'll see when you're scrolling through them, oh wait, the eyes are fully open on this shot, but not on that one. So I always encourage people to shoot more just get rid of the stuff that you don't need. Reformat the card and go out and do it again tomorrow. Okay? I mean, uh, it, it, there's a reason that photographers shoot a lot. And someone wrote to me, they better not be in this room, someone wrote to me, um, sent me an email, and said, you're not a good photographer. And they said, the reason you're not a good photographer is you shoot a lot of photos. And it just means that you're not thinking when you're shooting. And I wrote back to them and I said, I assure you, I think about every shot. And when I'm shooting an event and there's dancing, I do shoot a lot. But I do it because you know what, inevitably when they're doing the, someone's dancing, people look really weird when they're dancing. <laughs> Trust me, if I ever wanted to make someone look bad, we can, right? They get the weird face or like, you know, the, the upper bite look, you know, whatever. <laughs> but people, cannot look good when they're dancing. I shoot to get the one frame where everybody looks good. Or inevitably, you might get one really great shot of someone in the background, you got a little kid picking his nose. <laughs> Wait for him to put his hand down, you might get another good shot, right? So I shoot a lot. But even with the portrait, those little differences make a difference. All right, here's a shot um, that I took. Uh, my first ever, I've always wanted to shoot motorcycle racing, had never done it. Um, I got credentials to shoot on the track. Uh, it's probably about uh, six months ago, I'm guessing. I don't know. Um, and I went and I shot it. The funny thing was, if you said to me, what shot would you like to get? I mean, I don't want someone to get hurt. But I thought a really good wipeout would be pretty cool. So I go on the track. I got up there midway through. I waited for the pro race to start. So I got there around one in the afternoon. I don't remember what time it was. I went to shoot. I swear to you, the first four minutes I was on the track, this happened. And I was like, okay, I go home now. <laughs> Not really. Actually, now I was like, okay, I got that shot. Now I can have fun and experiment and do some other stuff. But um, everybody was fine. No one got uh, majorly hurt on this, which is good. But you can't tell me that I can get this shot if I was shooting in a single frame mode. And I was, I was shooting at 12 frames a second and I can, I have the successive shots of this guy sliding out of my frame. Um, but to get the one where he's in the air like that, it's a matter of shooting a lot. This one here was from Sochi, uh, the Olympics. Um, this is during the snow cross, uh, shooting with, a, I think it was a 7200 on the 1DX. And uh, we we're pretty close to the action. And uh, you know, getting that peak of action where she's down and grabbing the board, right? Again, a lot of frames to get that one that I really liked. This one here is a, a family portrait. A lot of people think like, really? Would you wanna shoot that much for a family portrait? I can tell you this family portrait, we probably took I don't know, 30, 40, 50 shots, I don't even know. We took a lot. Now this is a tough shoot because the white of the waterfall, I wanted motion in the water, but it was during the day. So I had to put a filter on to darken it. And then I metered for the background, again, kind of like I told you my night shots, I metered to get the motion. So I wanted to be at like, let's say half a second exposure. They had to stay still. The problem was at a low ISO for half a second, they were silhouetted. So I needed three flashes to actually get this shot. So I have one flash on my camera going right at them. Then I have my wife who was holding a flash. I think, were you in the water? I think she was in the water or somewhere over here. And then it's someone else that was in the water on the other side holding another flash. And using the Canon 600 flashes, the EX 600 RT flash has wireless. So I can control all the flashes from mine, which is so cool, love that. And so what I did was I just put them, I think I had them all at plus one, and I was just trying to overpower the background and light them with this frame. But 
the reason I show this one shot is we did the formal family portrait and then the dad went down like he was gonna splash his wife and everybody else kind of just played off of that and that was the frame that they liked the best and I liked the best. But again, if I was just shooting one picture, I would never have gotten this because this is just kind of one of these after moments. A wedding. Um, this one was in uh, the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina and it started raining. I think hopefully you can see the raindrops in the frame there. But this one here, I was shooting in burst mode and actually I was probably shooting at six frames a second here. Um, and when the rain started, the bride could have either started crying or just loving it. She was loving it. Um, but look at the expressions. I can tell you the frame before it and the frame after it were different. They weren't quite the same. But at least I had a lot to choose from. So do I overshoot? Maybe. Is it worth it? Absolutely. By the way, the guy that wrote to me and sent me that email, I wrote him a response back saying, I assure you, I think, on every shot. I wrote this long explanation of, you know, hey, you're to entitled to your opinion. And then it bounced back, he used a fake email address. So then I, and then I put it on Facebook, I said, hey, this guy wrote to me and I gave him a response, it wasn't even real, you coward. So that's pretty funny. So there. Um, creativity, and as I mentioned, for me, a lot of it is trying to you know, be creative. My wife is the creative one in the family. She's a painter and she's really artistic. Inherently, I, I'm not as much so, so I've had to learn it. But you're trying to think outside the box and trying to think something differently. And I strive for that with every shot. So when I'm shooting an event at a venue I've been at, like at a golf club, I've been to, I'm doing one this weekend. I've been there four times. But I don't want to do the same shots I did the last four times because I want to do something different for the client, but also to keep myself awake because I don't want to just have cookie cutter shots. And people ask me, like, would you ever do the, the sports shots where you go do the kids' soccer game and then you do all their, their team shots? I mean, that would kill me. I'm way too type A, it would kill me. Um, but I try to be different. And I think good photography, at least in my mind, good photography is to try to take something that everybody's photographed and then show it to the world in a different way. How many people here have a fisheye lens? I think fisheye lenses are a lot like that. They see the world in a way that the human being cannot. So one of the cool things about a fisheye is it creates that kind of look that can't be duplicated in any way, which is kind of fun. So sometimes I'll do it with a lens, sometimes I'll do it with the angle I'm shooting, and I'll show you that. Um, the other thing is you want to break the rules. Um, all the rules I'm giving you today, feel free to break them because that's, a, that's another rule. Um, you know, the thing with photography is it is subjective. Um, you know, I mean, there's certain things like I would not break the rule about the light and shadow. If you've got a shadow going through someone's face, unless it's a really cool shadow, don't do it, right? Um, but some of these other ones, you know, feel free to break. This is me in my living room being creative. I took a, uh, this is a frying pan with water. And you're going to think like, well, what's the color coming from? I took wrapping paper and I put it behind and I pointed the flash at the wrapping paper which then reflected off the water and gave me this shot and gave me the reflection inside the water droplet. I actually, that, this is on my blog, how to do this. I actually wrote the full explanation on how to do it. It's very easy to do and you can do it in your living room. I mean, you can do it anywhere you want, your kitchen, whatever. Here's a shot from uh, Sochi and uh, speed skaters. Um, I like the shot, I like the symmetry of the shot. It's good. I mean, nothing wrong with it, it's a good shot. Um, but this is a shot, so as I was shooting this, this was the uh, far left turn from me, and as they came toward me, the spotlights over the arena had come down and kind of blasted this one area, and I thought, oh shoot, that's gonna mess up all my shots. Until I realized, wait a second, I can meter this differently and actually highlight that. So what I did was I metered for the uh, bright, area on the ice to get the silhouette of the skater and you'll see I included the skates in the top of the frame so you know what we're looking at here and then I use that shadow as my subject and what I like about this and this this was uh, shown at the press center because it was so different than what everybody else took and the challenge with shooting the Olympics is you're with 2200 other really good photographers so it's pretty tough to be unique there because in every shot you've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 people in a similar position. So trying to see something different is always fun. This again is in uh, Red Square in, in Russia. 
this building is shot almost as much as uh, Statue of Liberty probably, um, very photographed. And so what I did was I actually rolled the zoom during the exposure just to try something different. I did this on the second day I was there. I wish I'd done it the first day because I had a blue sky behind it. It was just after, you know, it was after sunset and you had that deep blue sky. I prefer that over the black, but it wasn't until later that evening I thought, oh, I should roll the zoom and try something different. Same thing in Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, rolled the zoom during the exposure because again, very photographed uh, area, but I've never seen a photograph like this before. So I'm striving for something different. How many people here have uh, put the camera on a tripod and rolled the zoom during the exposure? Okay, not too many. Try it, it's fun. And again, memory's cheap, right? So if it doesn't come out, just delete it. Try rolling both directions, try different speeds. Um, you can also try leaving the, let's say it's a 10 second exposure, you can leave it for three seconds, then roll it for three or four seconds, and then leave it for another three or four seconds and see what it looks like. Try in different directions, try sometimes not leaving at all, maybe just do a slow zoom roll the whole exposure, which is what I did here. But have some fun with it, try it. Having fun, this was uh, two nights ago in Times Square. Uh, Ali and I couldn't sleep because we we're on West Coast time, so it was probably one in the morning. <laughs> we're like, oh, let's go have some fun. So again, this is actually sp uh, spinning the camera during the exposure. Um, for those who haven't tried it, it's really another fun technique that's kind of creative. Um, what I did is I set the camera at ISO 100. I was at uh, probably F6.3, probably a, I think half second or about a half second exposure maybe. There's a lot of light in Times Square. You can shoot Times Square like almost like daytime settings anytime you want. Um, so we do, I purposely had to go to somewhere that wasn't. This is right in front of the M&M store. That's what those are, and we just I just twist the camera slowly as I'm shooting. And the flash is on the camera, so the flash is lighting Ali up, but the background showing the motion. And this is confusing to people who are new to photography, because they're like, well, why isn't she all blurred as well? Right? The flash is, you have to be close enough to them that the flash is actually freezing them, but the background is so far away, it's not getting the additional help of that light, so it's going and we're getting the motion. So if you haven't tried it, try it, it's fun. Here we go. Should we use my brother as the example again? Keep it straight. Um, and this is one, another one I see a lot on social media where people post a photo from their vacation and it's a pretty good photo. He's like, yeah, yeah I've seen this too. Um, and there's some really good shots out there, but the horizons are really off. I, I'm a stickler for this. When I, even when I, when I shoot, I look to see if it's off by 2% because it really bugs me. Um, and sometimes uh, I'm a little too rigid about it, but you'll see this kind of photo. Cool sunset, right? But man, I just want to go like this. Yeah, it's not bad, right? Versus that. And it's easy to straighten in Photoshop or f whatever you're using, any of the photo you know, software, editing software will let you straighten. But you know, the difference between that and that is really drastic. Um, so I also put in here, unless. Now there are times when you actually don't mind uh, having crooked. This is not a good example, right? That's in China, that's way better. Now people would say, hey, look at my picture. It's, it's kind of cool, right? The lighting's cool, everything's good about it. It's just crooked. It's nice to have it straight. Now there are times when shooting off angle is not a bad thing. When I shoot race cars, it adds an element of excitement when you angle the camera and shoot. I even did this with the Statue of Liberty where I had the, the flame of, of the statue off to the side. I'm not sure if I put that in, on here, but I actually shot it off center to see how it looked. So it can work. So race cars can work. I don't think this works. It's kind of weird with water. <laughs> I put it in there just for fun, but it's kind of strange. Um, but like this one here I shot on purpose uh, in Sochi because I, I liked having the frame, the way that she was laid out, it kind of works. Because they're the, they're the subject way more than the background. And you could tell that the way it's framed, it was kind of purposely done. Same thing's true here in New York. I shot this one, um, is that, I think Columbus Circle, right? Quick, right, okay. So I was over Columbus Circle uh, three or four years ago. Uh, and uh, I went down almost by the train station entrance, I think it was, the subway station, yeah. and, uh, and I shot up on this, and you could tell by the buildings that I am nowhere near straight. But again, that wasn't the, the purpose of the shot. The purpose of the shot was to get this 
as my subject. So there are times when you can get away with it, do it, okay? But, but if you're shooting a horizon, straighten it if you can, if it, you know, for the most part. Here's one uh, uh, small, place in, small place in France. No one's ever. <laughs> and the Eiffel Tower has been shot a lot. Um, and again, I, I did some different unique things with it. This isn't all that unique, but I, I actually use this angle uh, to take the, your eye through the frame in a different way. So, with all of that said, there's some things that you have to remember. And that is, you want to experiment. So all the things that we just went through, there's 15 things that we just went through, all those can be broken. Okay, so, uh, and I have people who teach me and they say, uh, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Well, if that's the case, then some of those pictures that you saw that I really love wouldn't have been taken. So what you want to do is you want to be, uh, you want to know enough to know when you're breaking the rules and why you're breaking the rules, right? And then, and then try it and kind of, you know, bend things and, you know, be creative in your own mind. Photography is a really weird thing. People will look at the photos and say, you know, I, I've had people look at my website and go, this guy can't even shoot. And they're entitled to their own opinion. Um, I, look at, I look at stuff sometimes on the cover of a photo magazine and it's the photo of the year, I would have deleted it. <laughs> but it's just different taste, right? So everybody in this room is gonna have a different perspective of what they like and what they wanna shoot. So I don't want you guys to take away and go, I can't shoot centered. Of course you can, right? But know why you're shooting centered or why you're not shooting centered. Think about, so the thing is, you wanna think about every shot that you take, you know, what are you trying to portray and how are you trying to portray it? Because what is the goal with photography? The goal is to tell a story. So whether it's an event or traveling to Ellis Island, I'm shooting, and when I shot in Ellis Island a couple days ago, as I was shooting, I'm thinking about, we had just seen the movie that talked about all the people that came through Ellis Island, 12 million people. So as I'm shooting, I'm thinking about this great room, that great hall. How many people came through that area thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I make it into this country because I'm not going back, right? And they're tired and they're hungry and you know, they've been on a boat for a month. Or whatever. That's what I'm thinking about as I'm shooting. What happened in that room? And I'm trying to portray that in a way that I can. Sometimes you can through camera, sometimes you cannot. But at least have that passion to try to think about what you're doing in every shot that you take. And then the thing is, learn as you're doing it. Because there are times when you're gonna try something, when maybe it's the zoom trick, and it's gonna be phenomenal. And there's times you're gonna try the zoom trick and it's not gonna look good at all. But that's the fun thing about digital. You can turn around and look at your LCD on the display on your camera and go, wow, that worked, or that didn't work. And it also gives the ability to change something, and I encourage you to do this. When you're shooting, we're gonna take the zoom trick, you try that, Look down and see what you don't like. When I was shooting the pictures of Alley in Times Square, we were shooting and some of the images had white in the background and I didn't like it. Well, so we just kind of moved to a different area where I didn't have a white light there so I can just all the black and colored lights and not have any white. And then when you come back home and you download and you'll see, oh wait, that wasn't sharp. Maybe I should have been closer to my subject or whatever. These are the things that make it fun. And I always tell people, if I stop learning, I must stop shooting. Because the fun thing to me is to keep pushing that envelope and trying something different. And, and, I, and I can tell you that you, know, you sit in this room and hopefully learn something from me, but I sit, sat at a workshop last week with Greg Gorman and Stephen Wilkes and I learned something from them. So it's, it's a constant evolving to make ourselves get better. Who here has perfected photography? <laughs> right? Who here, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Good one, Al. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, Ali's gonna start shooting. I'm just gonna manage the photo studio. Yeah. <laughs> Who here would want to perfect it though? Like I really you do. I don't want to. I always want to strive to just keep doing something different and, and breaking those rules. And so that, this is the tough part about the presentation is I want it to be a starting point for everybody to think about it, and hopefully for people not you know to, to be able to control things and not make mistakes. But if they make them, they're doing it for a reason, right? And the, the most important thing about photography for me is to have fun with it. And I think the passion of photography is what comes through that lens. 
And the reason that I'm successful at photography is because I love it. And, I, and people will say to me all the time, like, it really looks like you're having fun when you're shooting this event. And I'm like, I am. And there's times I'm driving to the event and I'm tired. And I'm like, you know, sucking down my, you know, seventh Diet Coke. And I'm driving there thinking, how am I going to make it through this night? Because the party hasn't started yet. But the minute I get there, it's like the inspiration kicks in and I'm in, you know, in that mode. And then I just kind of get into it. And once you get into it and you're having fun with it, that's what comes back in the camera. I can tell you that if you don't have the passion, you don't want to be here, right? Because you don't want to be shooting. If you don't have passion, why are you doing this, right? You want to live it. And, and a lot of people try to fake it, or you see photographers who have been doing this for 30 years, they walk out of a room, you can just tell they don't care. They're just there to get a paycheck, hang it up. You know, time to let someone else do it. Because I think, have fun with it. How many people here, like, how many people here have had their lives changed by loving photography? That's cool. And it's funny, we had this discussion uh, this morning. I was, we were in Central Park, and I was telling my wife that I had been to New York, this is embarrassing, probably 10, maybe 15 times, had never even seen Central Park. Honestly, I just didn't care. I, I was in here for meetings and out. I, I stayed at the Marriott Marquis or the Sheraton, which is what, five blocks from, didn't even know it existed. Seriously, did not ever go. That was 15, 20 years ago. Then I got into photography, and a friend of mine said, I want to take you over to Central Park. I'm like, where is it? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> which actually, uh, which reminds me, we got off the boat at, Sta at Liberty Island, and somebody asked the guy on the boat as we're getting off, is this where the Statue of Liberty is? <laughs> <laughs> It was classic. I told Ali, I said, when we get off at Ellis Island, go, is this Eli's Island? <laughs> it was really funny. Um, but you know, sorry, now I lost my train of thought. Where was I here? <laughs> Thank you. So my friend took me to Central Park and I started shooting it. And actually the first time I went, I didn't shoot a lot. But as to what I was telling my wife today is, once I started shooting, the world looks differently to me. You guys get that? Like I see light in a different way. I see people's faces in a different way. I see the trees and the colors and the bark. And you know, we we're over at the carousel today. We we're looking at the details in, not the horses in the carousel, but like in the grill work and the front of the carousel. Like little stuff like that, that if I didn't do photography, I would have walked by and I guarantee you I wouldn't have noticed any of it. Just like the pictures that we saw earlier with the guy getting the baby handed to him, I wouldn't have noticed it. It would have been like, oh, the game's over, let's go. And photography has opened my eyes to see the world like in a totally different way. And to me, that's why I say, take the rules and break them because if it opens your eyes to the world and you see it and you see that kind of that light bulb go off and, you know, and, and you're like, I wanna do more of this, then, then you're doing photography right regardless of all the rules. I mean, I'd like to see it in focus. I'd like to see your horizon straight. But, but like feel that passion and work off of that and your photography will be great. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.